Good morning, guys. You're joining me today at the National Running Show at the NEC in Birmingham. It's uh, rather chilly today. We're looking forward to going in, seeing the stands, and uh, really looking forward to the presentations. So, hope you enjoy the video. Please do like and subscribe. Take care. True story, so I've had typhoid fever. Uh, any typhoid fever? <laughs> no? Okay. Five days in a hospital in El Salvador. Okay. Wow. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Uh, 2003. I cycled through uh, Central America for a year and uh, was eating too much street meat. Wow. I don't look up how you get typhoid fever from don't street meat. Don't look up the word street meat. Drugs, but, uh, <laughs> but yes, I had, uh, I had many needles put in my buttocks to get me over the typhoid. Uh, it was really the, but it was the best bed uh, and room that I stayed in in all of Central America. Air conditioned to myself it was fantastic. Well worth the seven thousand dollars it cost me to be in there for five days. Nice, wow. not the story. I, you don't I did not have to pay out of pocket. Thankfully, they locked me in a room for uh, two hours until they confirmed my insurance company would pay to let me out of the hospital in El Salvador. What would have happened if they wouldn't agree to it? Uh, I, I do not know the answer to that, thankfully, David, but... Uh, more things in the bottom? Oh, yeah, that's right, more things in the bottom, yeah. Bill's going up and bottom's going down. <laughs> well, we've already seen, we, we caught some of your talk yesterday, so we've had a bit of an introduction to your... You're probably more infamous over here for certain aspects, but I was also listening to The Naked Runner, Ginger Runner, yesterday, and um, you came into trail running because of... Down your mountain bike. Okay. Incorrect. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, that's, 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 that's a cool that's story. That's I like that. Yeah. Yeah. Don't, yeah. Don't, don't do research. Yes. That's what happens. In a previous life. So your research is uh, is not strong. Um, I decided that's what we to. Had as well. that was uh, I played really hockey, ice hockey for 22 years. Okay. I was not a runner uh, or an endurance athlete. At 26 years old, I went into. Uh, into um, Expedition adventure racing pursuits, which involved some there mountain biking, there so you, you were so close. Uh, and that's how I took my first steps into this scene, was wanting to do an expedition adventure race, uh, Eco Challenge being the big one. Back in the late 90s, in 2004, was when I started down this path that's led me to sitting here with you today and correcting you on your lack of research abilities. <laughs> Get used to that. Get used to that. But um, they pay you for this, don't they? <laughs> that's, that's, that's debatable. Maybe Not now. <laughs> and then, but I, I, this that podcast, you were saying how actually you were nervous about downhills and you practiced it and you, you feel that that has actually given you, because you can pick a line on a bike at such high speeds, that has allowed you to then transition. So what I had actually said, which is close but not quite, but yes, I did, <laughs> I did find that through downhill skiing and mountain biking, you have to process terrain at a slightly faster clip, and that allowed me to be more confident in doing it on foot. But I like the story you're weaving, though. I mean, tell me more about myself. To be honest, <laughs> if you're happy for me to make stuff up about you, oh, it's good. this is going to go this is very well done. Because I heard about the street meet time that we can't tell your wife about. But, uh, so, so tell us about the... Because um, you were known for winning the hurt repeatedly to begin with. Is, is that... Would you say is that one of your favorite races that you've done? Yeah, so the Hurt 100 mile race in Hawaii uh, happens in January, just happened a couple of weeks ago. Um, I, it was my second ever 100 mile race in 2010. And um, what I really loved about it primarily was the community around the race. You really felt like you were a part of something when you were there. But also I was living in North Vancouver, BC at the time. And our trails are super technical, big rocks, big roots. And when I arrived in Hawaii, I went in a, a recce run and I, I, within an hour, thought, I have home field advantage here. This is exactly the terrain that I'm training on in North Vancouver, and it allowed me to win the race in a course record time in my first ever running of the race. And then, and then I broke my foot twice, spent eight and a half months on crutches in a calendar year, it took two years to get back at it, and then won it in a faster time again in 2013, but then still standing course record. Did you, did you break your foot? On, on trail run? I was on a trail run with uh, Max King, who many of you may have heard of, and Jeff Rose, who I think you'd have to be in the scene for a couple of years to know who Jeff Rose was. 
I was running for Montreal Mountain Hardware and it was a team getaway. And I, uh, these were idols of mine. We were out on a run, we were a couple of miles in, and I went over on my foot really bad, excruciating pain. But because of who I was running with, I didn't make a peek. I just kept going and tried to run it off. And we stopped about 25 minutes later at an intersection and they said, uh, how long do you want to go for? And I said, I think I've broken my foot. And they said, what are you talking about? And then I took my shoe off and it was purple. And Max did- Was, um, it, was it gout? Uh, it was gout. <laughs> <laughs> I'm hoping Is we don't that go home with gout. Painful, Is painful that painful gout. Gout. Do I get gout just for being here? Do, yes. Okay. So Max uh, went and got his brand out, got a Subaru, rescued mission me to the hospital, and uh, turned out I had Jones fracture in my foot which is the fifth metatarsal, lack of blood flow. Crutches for three and a half months, got off for three months, refractured, get back on again. So it was a, it was a very tough year for me. Um, and um, and yeah, yeah, getting back from that and building back up again was quite rewarding to put that behind me. And at that stage, because a, lo a lot of runners can go through without having really big injuries. And was that one that really questioned whether you should continue doing trails with that? So I am fairly injury resistant, but when I get injured, I go big. And uh, I, like to, I like to fracture things along the way. The doctor who was seeing me at the time, because it wasn't my foot and because of the type of style of running I do, downhill technical running, his exact words were, you might never be able to do what you do again, which is, is really an awakening of, you know, there were tears shed that day and I was really uncertain as to where that was gonna lead me. And I spent the better part of that eight and a half months really trying to understand who I was as a person and what running meant to me and what I wanted to take away from that. Um, and it, it actually led me to becoming a race director because in that moment of what I call dealing with my running mortality, I wanted to be in the scene no matter what, you know, devoid of results and the ability to compete. And, um, and I started into the race directing scene and I've been doing it for, for a decade now. And that was my wake up call to realize that I wanted to be in this scene no matter what for the rest of my life and it's been a wonderful journey that I'm thankful for what I, that experience that I had back then. And that, that, because you now have a, a series of very successful races, the first one though, if, you, if people are thinking about putting on their, their own race, like, what was it like to actually take control of setting a course, what mistakes did you make, what advice would you give? Yeah, absolutely. The, so. Uh, Show of hands, who here has run the Squamish 50 races in Squamish, British Columbia? Right over here. Yeah, we saw him last year. Coming back again this year, right, for the 50-50. Uh, have you guys heard of the Squamish 50 by chance? If you haven't, it's our big race. It's the main one. It's in Squamish, British Columbia, middle of August. It's our 11th year this year. Um, and uh, I made lots of mistakes in the first few years with designing race courses because I would just pick um, on smaller courses, shorter distance, what I thought was the coolest route. And then we went to produce it, realizing that having multi-directional intersections was a really bad <laughs> idea and should be avoided at all costs. So you learn as you go, but, uh, but yeah, 10 years in, I'm quite proud of the fact that I now make my living entirely off of directing events and coaching runners. Do you think um, directing events and seeing it from the other side has done anything in terms of your own life, in terms of preparation, in terms of the way that you approach things, the way that you like, interact with community as well? It definitely has forced me to show even more gratitude when I'm doing an event to those people at that event. Not dissimilar from this right here now. It looks incredibly smooth, but I, I know there's a lot going on below the surface. There's a lot of ducks here with the feet going really heavy below the surface to keep it looking so smooth. Producing events is incredibly challenging. Making it look smooth, ch more challenging still. Um, so yeah, whenever I, I get the opportunity to do another event somewhere, I'm always quite thankful of the volunteers, especially because you cannot produce successful events without great volunteers. And, uh, and you, should, you should thank your volunteers every chance you get when you're doing races around the world. Well, we're still talking about events. What events have you done that um, you've experienced? You've got from an experience point of view, from an organizational point of view, this is, this is great. These are, these are, this, this is really better. This is, yeah, yeah, possibly all that you've learned. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I was taking notes for years doing races as to what I thought worked and what I thought didn't work kind of thing. And, um, and early on in the late 2000, into 2010, that's when I, 2012 was the first year that I directed an event, um, really paying attention to what felt meaningful when I was doing an event and always recognizing that it did have that, that additional community feel to it. Um, and I'm very fortunate where I live, there is a history of ultra running. There's a 50 kilometer race called the Neenacker that's over 30 years old. And they do it right, they have over 400 volunteers for 150 runners. And they have to turn volunteers away. So what I saw there was, you know, you, you want to, really my takeaway when I started this was that we were gonna celebrate 
every single finisher right to the very end to the last person and the people over time as though they were the winners of the race because they're why we're there. <laughs> and how was, because in the UK when COVID hit, there was a, a lot of fixture clash. Fixtures were being rolled over, it was hard to get volunteers and it seems as if the ultras and the races that have really survived have been the ones that have had that community and have almost called on it to, to get them through. Has, has it been similar in, in Canada? Absolutely. So 2022 was the first year we were back at full events. So we do seven races in a calendar year. It was great to be back at full events again. It was a struggle all year long to get the volunteers to come back out again. A lot of things changed through the pandemic for all of us with our priorities and our families, etc. Um, so we worked really hard to retain as many volunteers as we could. But we've seen other races in our space, both local to British Columbia, but then also through the American West, that um, are really struggling to get volunteers back out for the races again. Now, you mentioned how, um, how technical it is where, you, where you're based. What advice would you have for people if they haven't really experienced hard trails to, to get better at it? Honestly, it's like anything else. It really is just practice, getting, getting some experience out there. Um, so if you've signed up for a race that involves technical running or really steep terrain, you want to find a way to prioritize at least a couple of days in advance of that race, wherever your closest local access is, to try to mimic that, those race day conditions. And do you, do you think there is a way, because I, I think the challenge of a lot of people is being able to, the big races often are in the UK, so how can you try and replicate somewhere you're not going to be? Um, you've obviously had to do that with things like Barclay and um, other races where you've trained at home to, to go away. Have you got any tips for how you can try and make sure that your training is specific enough for the race you want to do? Yeah, it's, it's difficult. I mean, it, it's very centric for all of us as to where we're located and what we have access to. Um, I, I guess the biggest thing is when you're traveling internationally for an event, the time change is incredibly difficult. Last night was the first night. We've been here a week that I slept through the night, and I am more tired today than I've been for the rest of the week. So you really do need to find a way, if you can, to get to your destination early and acclimate to the local conditions. That, as much as anything, is going to help you out in your pursuits once you get there. And how... Now you, you have so many successful races, how has that affected how much you can trade and how much has it affected your own personal aspirations for success? Yeah, it's interesting because just this past summer I, I kind of had an epiphany out on a run and it was that I was still chasing my previous self in terms of running is fantastic because you really get out of it what you put into it. And if you work hard, you can get the results. And I did that. I was able to um, to sacrifice everything for the, the time and the training I put into those results that I had over the years, from the hurt course records on through to the Barkley pursuits. And and in the last few years, my uh, my wife and son are sitting right over there. My son will turn eight this summer, and uh, and we I put a prioritization on uh, on ensuring that that child feels supported and gets to to, to have his own pursuits that we um, we uh, facilitate. And with that, also ensuring that I'm putting the energy behind the, the races and the coaching for business. So my running has not been seeing the same results because I'm just not putting the time into it. But I am seeing the return on the things that I'm most um, dedicated to, and that is my, uh, my events, my business, and my family. And then running has taken a third tier to that, and that's okay. But it took me a couple of years to kind of accept that I can still race and I can still do things and still do okay at it. Um, but the lofty goals that I had set for myself previously can only be attained through putting in the lofty training that preceded it. And if I'm not able to do that, which I'm not, then I need to forgive myself a little bit for what the result ends up being. Was, was there a moment that kind of caused that shift or that <coughs> slow realization? Yeah, it was. So the last 100 miler that I did 18 months ago, the Cascade Crest 100 miler in Washington State, incredible race. It was the second time I had run it. And, um, and I came into the 55 mile mark, just past the halfway point, in the lead pack, feeling great, was convinced I was gonna win the race that year, my wife was too, and three miles later, I was puking all over the place and, and literally walked for 45 kilometers through the night. Um, but in looking back, previous to that, that's about where my training would get me, is a really good 50 mile race, so that was kind of the reckoning right there, and, um, and just, again, accepting where I'm at and, and realigning my goals for myself. And but is, do you find it hard to motivate yourself when you you know that you could train harder and you could achieve more? Um, do you? It's sometimes harder to actually keep your focus when you haven't got as big a carrot pulling you in. 
Yeah, I think you. I think having a really big, scary, lofty goal is important. That's what gets you up in the morning. That's what gets you out the door. That's what ensures that when the alarm goes off, you listen. It's what tells you when you're scrolling Instagram, you should probably be doing some active recovery or running right now. And it really, you know, it gets your priorities back in line. So, um, so with that, yeah, I am looking at some potential bigger races in the next few years and uh, and see how those unfold. But um, I think having a big goal that kind of scares you is really important. And what does scare you? Uh, just getting back to the 100 mile distance at this point. So I'm running a 120 mile race in August in British Columbia called the Fat Dog 120. Some of you may have heard of it. It's only 90 minutes away from us, so uh, I'm looking forward to trying that one out. And who knows, maybe we'll be back in the UK in a year and see what happens from there. What are, the, what are some of the biggest changes in the, in the way that you'll train for that now compared to maybe how you used to train either by hemmed in by work or, or, or anything else? So previously, a 100 mile training week was a given and stacking 100 mile training weeks was as easy as deciding I was gonna do it. And now I focus on ensuring I've got one quality long run per week uh, and a couple of quality intensity sessions per week. And then anything on top of that is kind of gravy. So my overall volume is probably 60% of what it was when I was competing near the front, near the pointy end. And that 40% of volume that I'm missing right now is what allowed me to get there. But you need to prioritize and really have some high caliber workouts. So two quality speed sessions, one long run, and that's enough to kind of keep my fitness to a level where I know I can get through the distance, and, and then you try to pull from experience in terms of racing smart, racing to your capabilities, letting people make mistakes in front of you, and then trying to pick up the, the pieces the, as other people are falling apart. And what would a long run be for you in that? So right now, my long run in January is just under 20 miles, okay. uh, and then that'll get up to 30 miles as we get closer to the, to the last couple of building blocks into the race. So it's actually not that dissimilar to if you say following a marathon training plan, but you're just extending slightly your, your long. And I'm, I've also been doing this for uh, over a decade now, since two, well, what is that? Um, since 2004, so closer to, closer to two decades. And, and you do end up with a really good base that you can pull from. So, you know, if I was starting from scratch, that's not gonna get me to where I need to be right now. But because I do have that experience, I know how to manage myself, I know how to manage fueling and pacing and that experience goes a long ways as well. So thank you with that foundation that I've built over 20 years. I don't need to do the, the serious high volume that I did to still be relatively competitive, I think. And then um, you've, you've refined, as you said, your, your fueling and your pacing, but what mistakes have you made along the way? Yeah, so the first 100 miler I ever ran was in 2008. It was a race called Stormy in Squamish. And um, I, I had a full nutrition plan all lined up for the race and for 50 miles everything was going great. Right about mile 55 everything went to hell and I just had to problem solve. And it was a relatively new race, only a couple of years in and the rain stations were kind of terrible. So I fueled the last 45 miles of that race on Coca-Cola, watermelon and water. And I drank over six liters of Coke to get to the finish line of the race. Wow. I won the race. I then extracted six liters of coke from my stomach after the finish line, and, uh, and I promised that would never have to be the case again. So I went to work on, the real, the real lesson is that you need to take the time to train your stomach as much as you're training your body in training. So the long, lo your longest long run each week, always head out the door with 250 calories for every hour that you're running, and make sure you're consuming those calories and getting really comfortable with what it is. Because it's, it's, when you're actually fueling 250 calories an hour while you're running, it feels like you are eating non-stop. And it's kind of the case. And if you don't have your stomach trained for that, it's almost impossible for your stomach to stand up to those rigors once you do get into your goal race. And what type of things are you eating in that time? Uh, it's seasonality and, and temperature variance in terms of a hot race, you really need viscous foods. When you're running a hot environment, Western States is a primary example, your blood is all in your extremities cooling your body. So you have no blood in your stomach to really digest solids. So you, you need really viscous, easy to digest substances. Running in the winter, spine race just happened, you could eat a lot more solids for that because you're not cooling your body, you're trying to keep it warm and you need that fire in your belly stoked with the, the calories that you're pulling in. So very much seasonally as we go through the year, we'll, we'll uh, offer changes to how and what I'm fueling with. What, what kind of viscous foods? What would you Gels, chews, drink mixes. You want to put some solids in from time to time, but you really want your primary fuel sources to be just easily digestible, where you're not redirecting that blood flow and then compromising your cooling system in the process. Now, the, um, the ultra scene has been dramatically changing the last three years, like UTMB, buying out, overtaking, setting up new races. Like, from a North American perspective, how do you, what's your view on this 
this new behemoth that seems to be dominating the trail. It's interesting. I try to reserve opinion until I see exactly how it's all been playing out. But um, I, w I saw the purchase, Iron Man buying a stake in UTMB a couple of years ago. Um, and a lot of vitriol around that, and kind of rightfully so. I mean, you really want the big races at the top to be leading by example. Um, something we do with our events, which we always have, is we give back to every community we operate in. We've donated over $350,000 back to the trails through trail organizations and search and rescue organizations. We plant two trees for every single bib that we sell. So we planted 6,500 trees uh, in my local community actually last year. I just did that in, uh, in November. Um, so our ethos as a company is always to make sure that we have a symbiotic relationship with each community that we operate in. And that's what I'd like to see from the top. Uh, I think there's an opportunity for that. I'll reserve opinion until I see how things play out. But it's a curious time in the sport for sure. There's more money than we've ever seen and, and that can come with pros and cons. And uh, um, yeah, we'll see how it plays out. I'm Anna known for their caring nature. Say again? I'm Anna known for their caring nature. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And, and do you think us as consumers should be driven by um, supporting races that we think are morally supportive and actually give it back to the community? I, I mean, you vote with your dollars, you all, and that's everything through life, right? You vote with your money as to what you support, what you choose to support. I think the dichotomy that people face is that they do produce some of the biggest, baddest, coolest, mm -hmm. most exceptional races on the planet, so I don't think a boycott is necessary or anything like that, but I will say it is necessary to support your local races. You know, make sure that those local community races that don't see a lot of funding um, have a presence and that, and that you give back to your community uh, to ensure that you always have the ability to choose exactly what you want to receive out of your races. Now, we, um, we interviewed a, a month or so ago uh, a couple from America who had set up a race where it was an equal entry, male and female, for their options um, in an attempt to try and just ensure that it was bringing more women into the sport. As a race director, how do you how do you balance the needs of um, selling your tickets, but also making sure that you have the continuity of community by keeping people who've run previously, and then offering up the opportunity to people who may not necessarily get in that ballot or some other mechanism to ensure that parity? I love the question, and my Squamish 15 races are the prime example that I can draw from. So we'll have 1,700 runners from 25 countries coming to Squamish this year. Something I'm most proud of over the years, we don't have a lottery, we don't have any entry prerequisites, we don't uh, allocate slots specifically. The Squamish 50 race right now is 52% male and 48% female registrations. We've been at an almost exact 50-50 split for the last six years. And I feel that you can accomplish that through other means, um, through your races, and, and we've always prioritized right from the top down. So it is myself and, and a single business partner, but our team is constructed mainly of women because they're smarter, more dedicated, and they really keep us on track while we're out there. But from the top down, we make sure that we are a balanced organization. And most importantly, for our races, we do um, celebrate everybody that's there. Something that we do that is relatively unique is in our, our entry level race, the 23 kilometer race. We don't have a cutoff for that race because it happens concurrently with the 50 kilometer race which has a 12 and a half hour cutoff. And some of the highlights for me every single year on the Sunday for that race is seeing male and female competitors come across a 23 kilometer finish line nine and a half hours after they've started because they can't partake in other races because the cutoffs are too tight. So I think there are other means to welcome a balanced community and I think it, it's, it's how you structure things that allows for that to, to occur. And have, have you seen a knock on effect that it's actually changing the people are buying and changing people's beliefs and, and actually having a massive impact on it. I think so, yeah, and I think it, it's like a, a, a stepping stone for, for people, right? You, you want to get your feet wet, all of us do. You start with the race that you think you can do, you know, a 5K or a 10K. And once you do that, you, you look at maybe the half marathon and you, you continue to build up to get into these longer distance races. And if you have entry level distances that are happening on the ultra weekends, I think the biggest thing is, and I've, I've said this for years, you know, if, some, if you've got a race that you're thinking about doing but it's kind of scaring you and you don't know if you can or should sign up for it, volunteer for that race, spend one day out there, you will see the exact version of yourself doing the race, and that will be everything that you need to know that you can and should sign up for it and make it happen for yourself. Now, um, your, your first, well, probably pronounced to the UK from your, your famous display in the Barclay documentary. Um, how, how has that been when you're 
you've, you've been so successful at numerous aspects of your running um, past, and then suddenly this one thing almost takes over people's minds. Yeah, it's been interesting. I admitted to you when we were talking pre that uh, you know the film. Um, so, out of curiosity, how many by hands? How many people have seen Where Dreams Go to Die? And and honestly, now how many people have not seen Where Dreams Go to Die? Okay, spoiler alert. It doesn't end the way we've got it, it on here. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, we did a film tour around that myself and Ethan Newberry, and we had 17 cities, 19 shows. So I had to watch the film 19 times. I had to watch it to approve it, and uh, and I think there was one other time. So I've watched the film 21 times, and I can't, I just can't. It still is too personal to watch it unfold the way that it does. It's like an out of body experience watching it happen. Uh, but I have made peace with it, and we are in a really good spot as a family. And I have long since come to terms with the fact that as much as I would roll back time and go left instead of right, uh, I wouldn't be sitting here if I did. So, you know, I've long, again, since made peace with the fact that the opportunities that have, have come to me because of the unique situation that I found myself in, I was a part of a viral moment in this sport, and trail running is such a niche sport, it's, those words don't even seem to make sense in a sentence together. Uh, and there aren't many of those. So the benefits that we've received as a family from that far outweigh the emotional component that it took to really deal with the, the fact that that race is done for me. Um, I had a seven year span of that being everything. I, I was there in 2016, with Jared Campbell, I was there in 2017 with John Kelly, and I was there in 2018 with Guillaume and Ali Beaven. Um, was the only fun run finisher that year. In 2019, I had a stress fracture in the neck of my femur, so I missed that calendar year. In 2020, we had a pandemic, and in 2021. And then this was the uh, this year I didn't even apply because it is time to to look at other things. Because because I've I've seen you post the uh, training runs where you been snowy, you've gone to some mountain nearby and done 12 hours of hill repeats, just training for, for the Barclay. Where is the balance between um, needing to almost be obsessed to achieve and that taking over and being too high a price? And this, you, so you hit the nail on the head really. It, you can't fudge your way through this race. I can't decide that I just want to show up and do the race. I've established what needs to happen physically for me over a period of many months. And I've replicated that successfully the four times that I was healthy enough to train for the race. When the pandemic hit, I found out, we found out as a society about things shutting down. That I did my last 12 hour, I did a 12 and a half hour overnight training session. I had done my full training block through the winter. And as I was driving home the morning of doing a 12 and a half overnight session with over 20,000 feet of vertical, that was when things shut down. I did every ounce of my training for that race, only to have the world shut down. So I put in the training for that race five times. And it does need to be, for this race in particular, for a lot of races, your absolute everything. And I just don't have the capacity, the bandwidth in my life right now to make that a priority. And it would be unfair of me to take that slot from someone else. And it would be, inaccurate for me to believe that I could show up on a, a, a compromised training block and still find success there. And have you, have you had to redefine how you view Barclay and, and your involvement in it? 100%. Yeah, it's, um, again, it's taken years and, and it, I, I know you can see like I, I'm processing and I am a little bit emotional because it was such an important part of my life, but um, we've been at peace for many years with it now and, and um, and are okay with the fact that we're moving on. But it did, it did, it took years. And after those experiences, it, it, it plagued me, it sat with me. I never got a break from it, ever. It, every single day, it was there in some capacity. And it's not a healthy place to be. And then, you know, I give everything to get back a couple more times, and then you realize that, and it's something that Barkley taught me, is it taught me the ability to forgive myself and to accept and, and be able to accept that what I had there, I got everything I wanted from the Barkley Marathons, save for one tiny detail. But honestly, the reason that it spoke to me to begin with is because it was the hardest race in the world and it was an impossible journey. And I got to a place in my running where 
there were, there were no 100 mile races that scared me. I knew I could finish the races. You obviously don't know if you can win or podium or whatnot, that's an unknown. But I knew I could finish them. And, and I lost my edge a little bit in terms of, as I mentioned, right, you just, when you're not scared, it, it, you lose a bit that extra 10% that you, you put in. And the Barkley gave me that. And it gave me that for years. And what I wanted, and I've always wanted, when I did expedition adventure racing, not down the mountain biking, to start into this scene, I wanted to do expedition adventure racing because when I saw Eco Challenge on television in 1998, I saw people on their knees begging for mercy being brought to their, their breaking point. I wasn't a runner. Running didn't speak to me, but that did. I thought, who am I? How would I respond in that scenario? I want to be there. I want to be confronted with a part of myself I've never known, never experienced. And Expedition gave me that, and Barkley was the next evolution and the next step in that journey for me. And what I got in my two five-lap runnings with Barkley, 16 and 17, was I was gifted with a challenge unlike any other that forced me to, to, um, to find reserves physically and more importantly mentally that I didn't know I possessed until I needed to find those. And that was pure magic for me to be able to walk away after those years and to know that I, I was who I wanted to be in that unique environment of having every reason on the planet to just give up and quit. And in the three times I ran the race, I never quit a single time. I ran until I timed out every single year. I think that that's the thing, isn't it? With, um, yeah. when, we, when we've spoken to Laz and he talks about Barclays, he talks about what the purpose was when he originally started it. It was never really about winning or competing anything. It was helping people find something in themselves that no other race would allow them to do. And that's, that's exactly what you're talking about there. Is that is exactly what he was, he, he set it up to, to do. And he set up multiple races to do that and the different challenges that they have. And, and how lucky am I that I walked away from those races with Jarrett Campbell and John Kelly as, as lifelong friends of mine. I mean, again, just an, a, an incredible benefit from it that we got to share those experiences together out there. So do you think if, um, if in 15 years time, 20 years time, your son says, Dad, should I apply? Which, if you go back to the start, would you have taken that journey? Or would you say to your son, yes, or would you be like, maybe go mountain biking instead? I, I, my son will be eight in August, and I already know that he is smarter than I ever was in my entire life, so he is not going to make those decisions. But I will say this. No matter what decisions he does make in his life, we're gonna we're gonna facilitate those and we're gonna support him. If in the strange universe that you've just described he does show up, I will completely laugh in his face, walk away, and say, "We'll be there," but I don't agree with the decision. How would how would other people describe you as a person? Like your friends, as, in terms of like the, you know, the mentality you bring to things, um, you know, the way that you communicate as well. How how would they describe you? Uh, that's a tough question to ask me to describe myself. I mean, I don't know. You'd have to ask them, really. Um, I don't know. The one thing I'll say is that I love my people. I love the people that are close to me in my world. And my goal when I'm hanging out with those people that I trust is to, is to have fun, is to have a laugh, and to find a way to share experiences that we won't forget together. Now, we're going to throw it open to questions, because I know there's going to be a lot um, from the floor. We've got Spike with the mic. So hilarious. We've got a question down here. Yes, sir. Oh, okay. Since you had your Barclay adventure, A, have you seen Laz, and has he spoke to you about what the future could hold for you? Yeah, Laz, we've had some email exchanges. Um, haven't seen him in person or had a conversation with him or anything. Honestly, his world has just changed so much in the last few years. It's taken off, right? And he's, he's an incredible celebrity himself. Um, and the success of his last man standing, last person standing races, uh, excuse me, is incredible. So. Uh, someone told me yesterday they were trying to get a hold of him and he has an agent now, which I thought was cool. <laughs> I feel like That's it's just an alternate email right. address and it's his alternate personality, but... Uh, you changed, you changed, yeah, Laz. Exactly. We, were, we, were, right. we were there when you needed help setting up the Skype <laughs> call and everything. Yeah, instead of asking for socks at check-in, he's asking for champagne now, I don't know. Uh, no, no, no direct communications, but uh, from a fan from afar and, and definitely with Barkley coming up here in eight weeks or so. 
Uh, I think this is the year. I think uh, I think there will be a finisher this year. There's a lot of super talented European runners that are going. Uh, I'm, I don't know all of the starters, but I know I know enough of them. Um, and it's been, I mean, the last finisher was six years ago in 2017, so uh, they need a finisher. They really like, you know, and I think the course will be slightly favorable. I think the only thing that will prevent a finish from this year is, is apocalyptic weather, which happens 50% of the time, so we shall see. Is, is John Kelly getting back to think? Uh, I don't know. I, I know John will be there for sure. He'll go yes. to the park. I don't know if he's planning to run the race, though. Okay. Um, any more questions? Yes. Hi, thanks so much. Uh, so this is more of a comparison type question to, uh, between you and me. Um, I'm James. Uh, first off, you have more hair on the top of your head. <laughs> is this like a, two images next to each other to point out the differences? <laughs> the, uh, the, th the thing I'm interested in is I did a 50 mile ultra last year and just after the halfway point uh, going through a forest area uh, went flat on the face. Uh, over a tree root, uh, cut, cut all over the place, picked myself up, carried on, 10 minutes later, went down again. This happened three times. Have you ever had a similar experience on any of your trail runs where you've, you know, had that kind of failures? Well, not failures, but incidents. As fleet of foot as I am, I will take a header pretty regularly, actually, or, or go over on an ankle. So I'm dusting myself off pretty regularly out there. And uh, the Hurt 100 uh, mile race, which again is five laps, super technical. And I remember maybe the last time I ran it, but the first lap was an absolute disaster for me. I went down five times and I accosted myself and basically just like, I had to remind myself that I needed to be present for every single footstep. Um, and interestingly, most big injuries that people do sustain are not on the super technical things where you're totally dialed in, it's when you're a mile from your house and you're on the non-technical stuff and you take a, take a header there when you're not really paying attention. So I think it's really just finding focus and, and staying in it. Um, do we have any more? Yes, we have Hi, um, this might be more of a question for your wife. But, <laughs> um, crewing you on a backyard, um, are there any tips from you for? Crewing me for what? Uh, on a, on a backyard. backyard. The back, oh, I haven't done the backyard ultra. Oh no, but I mean like, for laps, uh, you know, coming back, crewing you. Gotcha. Yeah. So yeah, what, what, like the crewing experience kind yeah. of thing? Um, crewing in general, is that what you're asking for? Like, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so organization is key. So making sure you know where all of your stuff is at any point. There's a, we call it a gear plosion. Once you enter the gear plosion, it's hard to come back from that. So keep you organized. Your runner's going to come in. It's going to be a little bit of chaos. So you want to make sure you know where are their gels, where are their favorite foods, where's their hat, where's their headlamp, all of that stuff. Call it torch, right? Um, and then they throw their stuff down. As soon as they leave, clean up, organize, and then move to the next spot. Because you don't want to get there and not know where stuff is. So just keep your stuff together. Yeah. And then and you need a safe word between you for uh, if you're actually going to, if I, if I can quit or not. So <laughs> in, uh, in so first and foremost, my wife and my child, do I mean very fortunate for that. My wife is the runner in the family. She's done more 100 milers than I have. She's done over 100 races of marathon distance and above, and she's done 35 marathons in a single year once. Um, so she, she knows a thing or two about what she's doing. But um, in 2017, uh, with Jared Campbell, I was fortunate to go to Colorado, and there's something down that way called the Nolan's 14ers. And it's 14 consecutive, 14,000 foot peaks, in about a 100 mile line. And I live at sea level. So a massive challenge to get a chance to go do this. And Jared and I set out and we were on record pace. That's what we were after. Oh, you have 60 hours. It's actually similar ethos to the Barkley kind of thing to be an official finisher. Um, we ended up with a massive storm that, uh, that came down on top of us. We were completely hypothermic on our eighth peak out of 14. And we called it. We dropped down a drainage out into our crew space. And, uh, and, and basically we were done with our pursuit of the, the 14ers. Um, we got the requisite attention that we needed from our loved ones. We were laying down kind of recovering and, and, and feeling sorry for ourselves. And my wife pops her head around the corner and says, you know you still have 30 hours, right? <laughs> and she's just walking away. <laughs> 
so we went back out, and Jared, Jared and I finished Nolan's as the only people that did an extra 10 miles to get through the 14 peaks, uh, 14 consecutive. So my wife was a big part of that, and she knew that I needed a boot in my ass, not a, not a hug to get out of here. Can I ask a question to your wife? Um, what have you observed in Gary when you've been crewing him that you might not have realized about how he's behaved or something he's done that you just wouldn't have taken in? Take it in, like. Yeah, he just wouldn't have been aware of he does this when he's in a race, or um, he says something silly, or he's actually hard to manage because of dot 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 dot. He's pretty easy to manage. I mean, before a race, <laughs> <laughs> before a race, we have a safe word, <laughs> um, which is Mount Fuji. We went to Ultra Trail Mount Fuji several years ago, and he was a mess beforehand. She nearly left me that weekend. Um, we seriously almost broke up, and I was like, if this is how you are, this is not happening. From, from and, nerves? Or from from nerves. Yeah, yeah, complete nerves. Really yeah. And and inability just, to be present for anybody yeah. else, just overwhelmed with my own anxiety that week. So, if he starts to get that way, I just have to say, Fuji, and then he takes a deep breath. Well, that was 13. I've gotten a lot better since he's then. He's gotten a lot better. He's self-aware, something I appreciate about him, um, but he, he's somebody who um, knows who to get what he needs from, so he knows he's going to get love from me when he needs it, so if you, you give me a look, you know, I'm like, okay, this is what he needs, and then he always needs um, Edmonton Oilers updates. My, my pro hockey team, so we've been here for seven days, and for the first six, we would go to sleep at 9 or 10 o'clock at night and I'd wake up at 2 in the morning. The problem is that that's the exact time that the hockey games are starting back in Canada. <laughs> so I found out how to get a British account. I had a two week free trial and I watched all my hockey games this week from 2 a.m. till 5 a.m. and then went back to sleep for a couple hours then. So I'm, I'm a mad hockey fan. And so if, if you're on the trail and someone sees you racing, they start shouting Fuji. Will you have some triggering response? <laughs> <laughs> I had a great race that year, despite how much anxiety there was. I was fourth in my first run at Ultra Trail Mount Fuji behind Sebastian Shagno, Julian Chore, and, uh, and a, a Japanese runner that won the race. So it was actually one of my best performances to date at that point, but I just had to be reminded by my loved one that I was not I was fit to be tied that week. Well, um, we've run out of time. I can probably squeeze in one more last, one last question. It's quite a mind to want to choose someone. Uh, it's coming down to the middle. Thanks, man. Yeah, my question was about um, aging. <laughs> I don't know exactly how old you are, Gary. Uh, 46 years old. 46 years old? You're older than I thought, actually. <laughs> 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 uh, but um, is there anything specific that you do now that you're older than you once were when you first started? To yeah, when, when I'm not in the UK, I sleep a lot more. <laughs> uh, but to keep, keep your body strong. No, absolutely. No, it's a great question. Actually, I appreciate that. Uh, and I coach runners. I actually have a female runner in her 70s right now. Um, so I'm quite aware of the aging curve and how it does affect us. Uh, and it's a lovely thing being in your 30s or earlier. I mean, any of you here right now that have a three at the beginning of your age, enjoy it while you can. It will, it will change rapidly as you go into your 40s. And it doesn't fall apart altogether, but it is, it is more challenging. The energy reserves are just a little bit different. Um, and I call it homework. As you get older, there's a lot more homework to becoming a runner. Uh, I was bulletproof. I started doing the running in, when I was 26, 27, and I had a 10 year stretch where I could do whatever I wanted, and I didn't have to stretch, I didn't have to do any recovery. And then as you get into your 40s, there's a laundry list of things you need to do to keep the hamstrings from seizing up, and the calves from shutting down, and my back from being sore, etc. So essentially, I, I would say the biggest thing is this. I, have a, I had a strength coach, that uh, assessed me specifically as to my own deficiencies and got a specific program for myself. And that's worked wonders for me. I had a slight hip uh, imbalance on my left side and really strengthening that has allowed me to stay true and uh, to alleviate a lot of those unnecessary stresses. And I also get a massage uh, every third week basically. Those things make a big difference, uh, but as you get a little bit older, you really do need to take care of your body and it's unique to you. But strength work is vital, I believe, as you get a little bit older to keeping your body function. And I consider that kind of armoring up and really keeping your muscles and your tendons and ligaments conditioned. Amazing, well, everybody please give it up for Gary Oldham.